When history reflects on Pearl Harbor, the attack is often remembered as a strictly aerial assault. But there was another, much smaller group of Japanese soldiers who were extensively trained for a little-known second phase of attacks to correspond with the air raids. This mission was comprised of ten men making up a secret and elite midget submarine force, called the Special Attack Naval Unit. They would ultimately be unsuccessful, and yet even their failure wouldn't go as planned. Tasked with destroying his own submarine, one of those men would instead accidentally pass out and become the first Japanese POW of World War II. It was late into the night of December 6th, 1941. America did not know it yet, but it would awake the next morning to find itself under siege. On the morning of December 7th, Pearl Harbor Naval Base on the Hawaiian island of Oahu would be bombarded with a series of surprise attacks from Japanese aircraft. It would be the final straw that drew the U.S. out of its isolationism and into the global scuffle of World War II. The infamous incident began at 7.48 a.m. local time in Hawaii. All eight Navy battleships docked at Pearl Harbor were damaged, and four sunk entirely to the bottom of the harbor. Three cruisers, three destroyers, and an anti-aircraft training ship were also severely damaged. In total, the attack took 2,403 American lives, along with another 1,178 who were wounded. Kazuo Sakamaki While his countrymen were conducting the far more visible assault on Pearl Harbor from above, Kazuo Sakamaki, meanwhile, was climbing into a small midget submarine of the Kohyoteki class. He would be part of a second, less remembered component of the Pearl Harbor attack, an underwater siege that would complement the aerial bombardment with torpedoes launched from a fleet of miniature subs. There were five Kohyoteki submarines in total, each carrying two Japanese soldiers. They were 74 feet long, weighed 30 tons, and were equipped with radios and two torpedoes, each packed with a thousand pound warheads. Powered by rows of batteries lining the hull, they could travel at 19 knots when submerged, but could only sustain a charge lasting 55 minutes. Without their own generators, the craft could only be recharged by a surface ship or mothership submarine. Sakamaki was born on November 8, 1918, in what is now part of the city of Awa in the Tokushima prefecture of Japan. He was one of eight sons, and graduated in 1940 from the Imperial Japanese Naval Academy. He learned to fly aircraft at the Kasumi Gatora Airfield, to pilot sea crafts aboard the training ship Abukuma, and underwent specialized naval training at Chujo Bay, a major Japanese naval base that in its own way mirrored Pearl Harbor. Upon completion of his training, he was commissioned as a sub-lieutenant. Sakamaki was one of ten Japanese servicemen, five officers and five petty officers, chosen to crew the five Kohyoteki submarines. These personnel were selected by several variables, but were generally regarded as strong-willed, determined, and free from familiar responsibility. Sakamaki was reportedly chosen because he came from a large family, and his parents would have seven older brothers to help see them through old age. As he would later recall, quote, None of us were volunteers. We had all been ordered to our assignment. That none of us objected goes without saying. We knew that punishment was very severe if we objected. We were supposed to feel highly honored. Preparations Five mothership Japanese submarines, the I-16, I-18, I-20, I-22, and I-24, were used to tow their miniature companions into the dark waters off the coast of Oahu. Steel belts used to secure the craft were released when the larger submarines were submerged, allowing them to escape detection. Sakamaki and his fellow submarine pilots were given strict orders about the types of American crafts to attack once the attack was underway. The sub-pilots were to prioritize, in order, aircraft carriers first, then battleships, then heavy cruisers. The coast of Lanai Island, a smaller island in the Hawaiian chain, was chosen as the rendezvous point for any surviving submarine pilots, but Sakamaki knew that this was only given as a formality. They were all expected to fight this battle to the death. As Sakamaki and his companion, Kiyoshi Inagaki, departed in their midget sub, the HA-19, he discovered a, quote, nasty shock the vehicle's gyro compass, which allowed its pilot to navigate directionally in indistinguishable depths by always displaying true north, was not working. Sakamaki could not determine the reason for the malfunction, and recalls that, quote, there was no time for repairs. After reporting the issue to his captain, he, quote, decided to attempt to make the journey anyway. He would instead steer by memory. 
the attack. Sakamaki found navigating the waters without the gyro compass to be nearly impossible, so much so that he almost missed the coordinated attack entirely. He arrived at the entrance to Pearl Harbor at 7 a.m., with the strike set to begin at 7.50. But once he entered the harbor and the attack commenced, Sakamaki and his craft were once again plunged into chaos. He would attempt to surface to orient the sub, and the craft would immediately come under fire from American artillery and depth charges. He would come across small U.S. crafts such as minesweepers and destroyers, but decided not to engage them, holding out for the larger payload targets as instructed. He and Inagaki watched from a distance through the sub-periscope as the harbor burned in the distance, emitting massive columns of dark smoke. They assumed they would miss the attack entirely and feared the shame of returning home unsuccessful in their mission. Finally, after hours of directionless drifting, their midget sub became ensnared and was eventually grounded in a thick coral reef. Bilge water leaked into the craft and made contact with its battery racks, causing them to smoke and filling the sub with poisonous gas. Sakamaki's survival instincts kicked in as he knew they needed to find land or they would die meaningless death apart from their fellow Imperial soldiers. The Aftermath The pair decided to make a last-ditch effort to find Lanai, the rendezvous point for survivors. They located what they believed to be the small island, but the sub was again grounded in its surrounding reefs. Sakamaki and Inagaki decided to abandon the sub and swim for land. But first, they rigged the craft with explosives, planning to destroy it so it would not fall into enemy hands. But the miscues of their disastrous day continued. The explosive charges strapped to the submarine did not ignite, and the submarine was left intact on the reef. The pair of Japanese soldiers, meanwhile, desperately swam for shore, both still dazed and nearly unconscious from the toxic fumes in the sub. Inagaki was lost in the waves and drowned, though his body was never found. Sakamaki, meanwhile, had set an explosive charge to scuttle the submarine and swam to the bottom to investigate when it failed to detonate. He reportedly passed out due to lack of oxygen and subsequently washed up on Waimanalo Beach. He awoke a short time later. An American soldier named David Akui had located him and was now standing over Sakamaki with a pistol trained on him. While Sakamaki had thought that he had piloted the sub back to the remote island of Lanai, he had in fact been going in circles around the island of Oahu and had washed ashore in an area crawling with American soldiers in the immediate aftermath of the Pearl Harbor tragedy. Quote, I was terribly ashamed. I asked for an opportunity to die an honorable death, but the American soldiers just laughed at me, Sakamaki remembered. His submarine was later recovered from the reef, and both pilot and craft were brought into U.S. captivity, where Sakamaki became, quote, prisoner number one in U.S. records. Captivity By the end of the chaotic morning, nine of the ten Japanese submarine pilots had perished, with Sakamaki the only known survivor. However, if word of his survival reached the Japanese military or media at any point, they did nothing to acknowledge him. Instead, they enshrined all ten submarine pilots as lost to a noble cause. Sakamaki was quietly removed from all official Japanese records and ceased to exist in the eyes of the country. Sakamaki's mangled submarine, which ironically had caused him enough trouble that it had ultimately led to his survival, was brought to the mainland, where it was taken on extensive cross-country tours and touted as an example of America's military might used to boost patriotism and sell war bonds. Sakamaki had the dubious distinction of becoming the first prisoner of war taken by the American military in World War II. He was taken to Sand Island, a small island within Honolulu Harbor, which in the 19th century was used to quarantine passengers from ships suspected to be carrying contagious diseases. It would eventually become a fully operational army internment camp to house Japanese Americans. Sakamaki would spend the remainder of the war in prisoner of war camps on the American continent. He began his time as a prisoner of war in a deep depression brought on by his failures, but over time, he began to regain his humanity and identity. He became something of a leader to other Japanese POWs, counseling them in their depression and encouraging them to learn English and engage with their captors. A Pearl Harbor Mystery Sakamaki was finally repatriated to Japan following the Emperor's surrender in August of 1945. By this time, he had been fundamentally changed by his wartime experiences. He was now deeply committed to the tenets of pacifism and could not recall what compelled him to join the Japanese military in the first place. In all, it's thought that 50 Type A Kohyateki midget submarines were built by Japan for use in World War II. Even though the name translated to Type A target, 
The designation was intended to keep any enemy intelligence gathering efforts from determining that they were armed and operational. Most of the other 50 midget subs remain unaccounted for, although a handful were recaptured in other encounters in Australia, Guam, Guadalcanal, and Kiska Island. Of the Pearl Harbor mission, it is thought that two of the submarines may have actually made it to the harbor. Although the mission was deemed a failure, controversial photo evidence suggests that another one of the submarines may have made it to Battleship Row and successfully launched both of its torpedoes. A wartime report from Admiral Nimitz indicated that at least one dud submarine launch torpedo was recovered from the harbor. Another may have impacted the already capsizing USS Oklahoma. Neither the US nor Japan officially acknowledges this possible version of events. Thanks for watching Dark Docs. Please like and subscribe to support the channel and our mission to tell cinematic stories about dark and obscure moments from history. And if you want to know even more about the mysterious Pearl Harbor submarine photo mentioned in this video, check out our analysis in our Dark Photos series, currently posted on our main channel, Dark Five.